this is chapter 20 dealing with gram negative uh, cocci and bacilli bacteria that are human pathogenic. Gram negative bacteria, as you know, are going to look the reddish pink when doing the gram stain. Uh, and they're going to comprise the largest group of uh, pathogenic microorganisms to humans. Um, if you remember one thing about gram negatives, when we discussed earlier the difference in their cell wall from gram positive bacteria, is that they do contain lipid A in that cell wall. And that lipid A, when it's released when, upon cell death, it is going to trigger fever, it's going to trigger vasodilation, it can trigger the inflammatory response leading to shock, and if too much of it is released, that the concentration is too high, it actually can be fatal. So it's something to keep in mind when treating the patients. Most of the gram-negative bacteria um, that are going to be causing diseases, they have breached that first line of defense and entered the body and penetrated in it. Um, they will grow at 37 degrees Celsius. Some of them are able to evade the immune system once they're in. And one thing that you will notice as we go through this is that some of these exist naturally in your body in one system, maybe in the intestinal system. But when you put them in a different location, then that is when they cause disease. That lipid A, that endotoxin that is released upon death, it is not released when the cell is living. It is only released upon death of the bacterial cell. As you can see here, it outlines how it can have multiple effects um, on the body leading towards inflammation, fever, etc. We're going to go through different genera one by one and talk about the structure, the physiology, and some of the diseases that they do cause. The first one we're going to look at is cocci. It is the only gram-negative cocci that you typically will see causing diseases in humans. And this genus is Neisseria. Uh, typically it will be a diplococcus, meaning you have two of them together. They're kind of kidney-shaped. Uh, they are non-modal. They are aerobic. They will test oxidase positive. Uh, you can use the oxidase test to distinguish it from several of the other gram-negative pathogens. Uh, two main species will be Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitis. On this slide, you can see how the bacteria do occur in pairs, which is why we call it diplococcus, and that there is a capsule that is around it that gives an extra virulence factor to it, protecting it uh, should phagocytosis occur. Neisseria gonorrhea um, causes gonorrhea, which only occurs in humans. It is a sexually transmitted disease. Um, in the United States, most of the cases tend to occur in younger um, individuals and adolescents. It's more common in females than in males, oftentimes asymptomatic. So on this uh, graph, you can see certainly how the number of cases have decreased since uh, a peak in the late 70s, early 80s, and it has decreased dramatically since then. And then the second bottom graph of the United States does show the incidence relative uh, number of cases to location. What happens is the bacteria will uh, adhere to genital, urinary, and digestive tract depending on where it was introduced. Um, it does secrete a proteus enzyme that will break down proteins, such as the IgA, which is supposed to help flag it for destruction. And it can survive within the neutrophils. In men, it's more easily detected. It usually causes painful urination. Women are often asymptomatic and can over time lead to pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, it is possible to have infections. Um, 
other than with the reproductive systems. You can have infection of the cornea, the respiratory tract. This is a concern for newborns. If the mother has been infected, that the newborn can be infected during childbirth. So how are you going to diagnose it? <clears throat> Excuse me. You can use different genetic probes. Um, you can try using some medications. A growing concern is that there are resistant strains to medications um, appearing. Prevention, sexual abstinence, uh, proper condom use, only one partner, etc. And in terms of newborns to prevent eye infections, you can give antibiotics in that case. For Neisseria meningitidis, um, it used to be the most common cause of meningitis in individuals under 20 years of age. It's often part of the normal flora, the normal set of bacteria that are existing in your upper respiratory tract. The problem is, once again, that's where it's normally found. You put it in a different location and it can cause disease. How is it spread? Often by respiratory uh, droplets amongst people who are in close contact, coughing, sneezing. The problem is uh, meningitis is inflammation of the meninges, those connective, uh, those connective tissue membranes that are surrounding the spinal cord and the brain. And so when that gets inflamed, that's what meningitis is. <clears throat> this... Um, infection, this inflammation of the, uh, the meninges by the bacteria is extremely severe. The symptoms can start very quickly and death can occur within uh, about six hours. So if it's suspected, it needs to be treated immediately. It can cause uh, necrosis on the skin, these rashes, and then the skin starts to die from that. Um, so you, you need to get that rapid diagnosis. And once the diagnosis is there, you start intravenous um, penicillin. It's the fastest way to get it in. Prevention. There are uh, vaccines against some of the strains. One of the big problems is that several individuals can be asymptomatic. And that's what makes eradication so difficult is how do you know to treat someone who's asymptomatic? They're not intentionally spreading it. They don't know that they have it because they're not showing any symptoms. I'm going to move on to the pathogenic, still gram-negative, but those that are bacilli-shaped. Starting first with uh, the facultative anaerobic bacilli. There's two main families that contain most of the human pathogens, the Enterobacteraceae and Pasteurylaceae. You can use the oxidase test to distinguish between these. Um, and like I said, this is going to include most of the pathogens. The oxidase test, just quick review, when you do it, a positive test, once you've added the reagent, it's purple is on the right. If it remains the yellowish color as seen on the left, that would be a negative test. And on this pie chart, it does show um, a breakdown of infections as seen in the United States between gram positive, <coughs> excuse me, gram negative. And then it has broken the gram negative bacteria down. As you can see, most of the infections are caused by the gram negative, specifically the within the Enterobacteriaceae family, a large component of them are caused by particular uh, genus Escherichia. Most of you are familiar with the species of that, Escherichia coli, commonly called E. coli. So we'll be discussing these. The Enterobacter aces, um, they exist naturally in the intestines of most animals, including humans. They're also very common in soil and water and in uh, decaying plants. Uh, once again, the problem is they're naturally in the intestines. The problem is when they are somehow transmitted or transferred out of the intestines to another area of the body. It has to do with different receptors that um, are there on your cells that they can attach to, etc. Most of these are bacilli. Some of them are coxobacilli, meaning 
they're they're not exactly spherical in shape, but they're not long. Besides, they're kind of oval. Uh, most of them are modal. They grow mostly in aerobic environments best. How do you distinguish between them? Usually, it's going to be by biochemical testing. So if you look at the gram stain of them, uh, they're going to be red. And as you can see, some of them are more uh, definitely bacilli shaped. Some are that cocci bacilli. This dichotomous key just gives an example of how you would use biochemical testing to be able to distinguish between the different genera. How are they pathogenic? Well, they have a lot of uh, different components that can add up to allow for increased virulence. Sometimes it has to do with the components of the membrane, proteins that may be there, is there a capsule or not. Um, and so this allows for the variability between the different genera and different species, once again, as to how, how virulent are they. Because they are gram-negative, they're all going to contain the lipid A in that outermost membrane. Some of them will contain additional antigens that will assist in the virulence for them. Some of them will have uh, flagella that's going to help them move in their environment. Some of them will secrete different factors, such as hemolysin, which is going to be used to break down red blood cells. Some of them will have adhesins, which help them to stick or adhere to the host cell, your cell. Some of them will contain plasmids, which often on the plasmid there may be virulence genes, there may be antibiotic resistance genes. Some of them will secrete exotoxins. So how are you going to diagnose them? Diagnosis will be done by collecting samples. Um, they can be found in the urine, the blood, the cerebral spinal fluid. And you will use biochemical tests to try to rapidly identify them so you can start treatment right away. If it's an internal infection, you can treat with antibiotics, depending what genus it is, depends on which antibiotic you're going to use. A lot of these you're going to find will cause uh, diarrhea. That's usually self-limiting, meaning it's got to run its course. Um, what's prevention? Good personal hygiene and good proper sewage control. If people can have clean water, clean proper sewage, you can break the transmission cycle of this. And that's going to be a common thing that you're going to find through this. Another example of some of the biochemical testing that we can use. Uh, this is showing an example of one that's the McConkie auger. The McConkie auger on the left has been inoculated with both Staphylococcus aureus on the bottom and Escherichia coli on the top. McConkie auger is a selective antidifferential medium. It does contain different dyes um, that inhibit the growth of gram positive. So your Staphylococcus aureus, which is gram positive, will not grow on the McConkie auger plate. Only gram negatives will grow. And then it's selective in that you can distinguish between your lactose firmer, fermenters and non lactose fermenters between is it uh, yellow or is it red as seen on the right plate. So if we start by looking uh, at the Enterobacter ACE, family. It's divided into three different groups. You have your coliforms. These can very rapidly ferment lactose. Most of these are going to be part of your normal intestinal microbiota, meaning the normal microorganisms that are living there in a healthy individual, but you put them in a different location and they can cause disease, so they're opportunistic. The second group are your non-coliform opportunistics, so these do not ferment lactose. And then your true pathogens are the third category. We're going to look first at the coliforms. These can be either aerobic or facultative anaerobics. Once again, all of these are going to be gram-negatives. Um, 
because they are coliforms, they are capable of fermenting lactose, so they will form gas. They're commonly found in soil, on plants, decaying vegetation. They do, as I said, uh, naturally uh, exist in your intestinal tract. Coliforms are often used to indicate water quality. Um, for drinking water purposes, usually you do a, a test that's called a total coliform test, and you can detect if there are any coliforms in the, the water supply. If they are present, you do not want to use that water for human consumption. It's contaminated. For sewage treatment plants, usually what you are testing for are what we call the fecal coliforms. So they're still coliforms. And that would be indicative that the sewage treatment facility, if those are detected in the water that's being released, then your process is not up to par. You need to, you have a breakdown somewhere. You have very poor sewage treatment there. Escherichia coli is probably the most common one, the most important of the coliforms. Uh, in terms of water treatment, I'll just mention that E. coli is the indicator organism that is used here in the United States when testing for water quality from sewage treatment plants. If E. coli is there, it indicates that there is not only fecal uh, contamination, but it is fairly recent fecal contamination. So obviously, don't drink the water. Um, there are different markers that we call antigens on the surface of the um, cell wall of E. coli that we can use to identify different strains. So sometimes you will see it written out as E. coli and then a series of letters and numbers. That's the strain designation. And so how do they get those? It has to do with the antigens that are on the cell wall. Virulent strains do tend to have plasmids uh, that have genes for adhesins, allowing them attached to the host cell for producing various exotoxins. E. coli can cause several different diseases. One of the big ones is gastroenteritis. Um, and this is where when the, it's in the wrong location in the intestinal system and it's producing enterotoxins. As a patient, what do you uh, end up with it's what we sometimes refer very politely as intestinal distress you will have diarrhea you have cramps nausea and vomiting uh, in some places this is fairly common in children so the pediatric diarrhea is often caused by E. coli what happens um, is usually you ate something that was uh, contaminated. One of the more common strains that we see is E. coli 0157H7. As I said, those letters are designation of the strain. Um, it's probably the most prevalent strain that we see in developed countries. It will cause diarrhea. Um, it's often consumed or transmitted because you consume undercooked uh, ground beef, contaminated milk, contaminated fruit juice. Um, a lot of this can be prevented if you cook your meat. So cook your hamburger. It's often associated with the ground beef or hamburger meat. Cook it until it's not red. Do not have the cow still mooing. You need to cook the meat. That will prevent it. Um, like I said earlier, E. coli can cause several different diseases when it's in the wrong location. If it gets in the urinary tract, it can cause urinary tract infections. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Klebsiella is in the digestive and respiratory system of humans. It has a capsule around it that does help to protect it from being um, engulfed by phagocytosis. It can also be opportunistic. If it goes in the lungs, it can cause a form of pneumonia. Uh, it, if it's in the urinary tract, it can cause urinary tract infections. It can cause a form of meningitis. The slide shows the bacteria, the Klebsiella pneumonia, that has that capsule, that white around the cell. That's the capsule. 
That's a protective thing for the bacteria. Another uh, genera is Serratia. Serratia is unique in that it produces uh, a red, pig red pigment when it's grown at room temperature. From a healthcare standpoint, the problem is Serratia can grow on catheters and saline solution, and so any type of tubing, it can be a problem, intubation tubes uh, in a hospital setting. It can cause uh, opportunistic infections in someone who is immunocompromised. Usually it's not a problem for healthy individuals, but if you're immunosuppressed, that's where the problem comes in. And there's uh, more developing resistance to antimicrobial drugs. This is the red colonies that it looks like. That red pigment is only at room temperature. If you grow it at 37, it will be kind of a beige color. Enterobacter, hafni, and citrobacter are all found in soil, water, sewage, decaying uh, plants. They can be in the uh, digestive tract of animals. If it, Enterobacter uh, can often contaminate dairy products. It becomes opportunistic then when you um, consume contaminated materials. Once again, with immunocompromised patients, they're going to be at highest risk. And there are issues with resistance to the antibiotics. Non-coliform proteus is a faculty anaerobe. Proteus mirabilis is the most common uh, pathogen out of the proteus genera that you're going to come in contact with. We do work with proteus vulgaris oftentimes in the lab because that is uh, non-pathogenic. Proteus mirabilis is often associated with urinary tract infections, uh, typically with those patients that have had a catheter in for a very long time. Ideally, if a patient has to have a catheter in, ideally for as little time as possible. If you can remove it as soon as possible, that reduces risk of infections. Morganella. Provencia and Edwardsiella also are all associated mostly with urinary tract infections and higher risk once again are going to be those patients that are immunocompromised. So you're going to see that a lot of these are truly opportunistic. Healthy individuals, they're not going to cause any problems. Now the category of the pathogenic uh, Enterobacter AC members, this is a different story. These are true pathogens. They can cause disease even in healthy individuals. The three main ones that we're looking at here are Salmonella, Shigella, and Yersinia. They have several virulence factors. Um, they can secrete enzymes. They can secrete proteins that are going to interfere with the host cell. Some of these proteins will inhibit phagocytosis, allowing the bacteria to survive. Some of them actually secrete other proteins that start to rearrange the cytoskeleton in your cells, and it can also induce apoptosis, which is cell death. Salmonella typically also lives in the intestines of birds and reptiles and mammals. Uh, most of the human infection is going to be due to consuming contaminated food or handling of one of these uh, animals that serves as a reservoir. Uh, reptiles, just so you know, turtles are notorious for carrying salmonella. If you have a pet turtle, it is highly, highly recommended that whenever you handle the turtle, as soon as uh, possible after handling, wash your hands very well with soap and water. You do not want to be handling the turtle and then with bare hands and then without washing possibly touch your face and contaminate yourself in that manner. <coughs> Birds also, as I mentioned, are known to be a reservoir of um, salmonella. So oftentimes chicken and eggs are sources for human uh, contamination can cause salmonella osis as well as typhoid fever. Salmonella osis, what happens here is you have consumed that, say you're eating eggs, 
you didn't cook them well and they were contaminated or the chicken was not cooked fully and you it was contaminated with salmonella and you ate your chicken taco or whatever what happens then in the small intestines the bacteria is able to, if it's able to survive all the way through the salmonella will attach to the epithelial cells that are lining the small intestines they are engulfed in the cell then they start to multiply in the cell and then they end up killing that host cell once they have killed that host cell then the bacteria can spread to adjacent cells and start that process over again that's going to induce fever cramps and diarrhea this salmonella can also because the capillaries are very close, because the purpose of the small intestines is to finish digestion and then absorb those nutrients, you have a very high blood supply right there. The salmonella can cross the capillaries and enter into the bloodstream, and now you've got bacteremia. The salmonella is in, and the blood can go anywhere. Um, I said the, the symptoms usually are fever, severe cramps, severe diarrhea. You need to start treating for the loss of fluid and try to maintain proper hydration. Uh, with salmonella food poisoning, usually think back 8 to 12 hours before you start showing symptoms. And what did you eat? What did you consume? And that's, that's usually going to tell you what it is. Salmonella can also call, cause typhoid uh, fever. Humans are the only host, and one of the problems with this is that carriers are often asymptomatic, so they can be shedding the salmonella, and if, uh, depending on circumstances, touching others, uh, historically, there's a case of Typhoid Mary, where she was a cook in New York, she did not wash her hands very well, they didn't know about good hand washing, and she didn't wash her hands well. She was a carrier. She did not show any symptoms of typhoid fever. However, she was shedding the bacteria, and she did not wash her hands well, and she was a cook and preparing food, and the food would get contaminated, then others would eat it, and so that's how it was passed on. Uh, This shows a graph of the incidence of both typhoid fever and red salmonellaosis in the, the lighter pink color. As you can see, typhoid uh, fever has greatly reduced. A lot of this has to do with education, washing hands, realizing how it's being transmitted, laws put into place in food, uh, commercial food preparation establishments to prevent the spread. Salmonellaosis, unfortunately, we've seen spikes and then it starts to come down, and then it spikes again. Um, so we need to improve that, that line, definitely. As I said earlier, salmonella osis, you're going to treat with fluid, and not just water, but electrolytes, because you're losing, oftentimes via diarrhea and vomiting, you're losing fluids. You need to replace that as best you can. Typhoid fever can be treated with antimicrobial drugs. Uh, sometimes individuals who are carriers, asymptomatic carriers for typhoid fever, they have found that oftentimes uh, the gallbladder seems to be a place where the bacteria kind of like hangs out there. And so sometimes if they know you're an asymptomatic carrier not responding to antimicrobial drugs, they may choose to remove your gallbladder. There are vaccines that are available for protection for travelers for short-term uh, situations. To give you an idea of the amount of fluid loss that can be experienced from the salmonella food poisoning, which is salmonella, it says, um, I hate to admit, but I ate something when I was in grad school that was contaminated, did get salmonella food poisoning, and I lost four pounds in 36 hours. So not the diet program you want to go on. Shigella. This is uh, another bacteria. 
that can be a parasite of the digestive tract. It produces an enterotoxin that causes diarrhea, some species very severe diarrhea. There's four species that can uh, be pathogenic to humans, Shigella dysenteriae, Shigella flexneri, Shigella voidii, and Shigella sonia. Uh, by far, Shigella dysenteria is the worst. Um, these are all parasites of the human digestive tract. Shigellaosis is a severe form of dysentery uh, caused by the Shigella sonii. Um, Shigella flexneri is also um, can cause this. We see a difference in the species depending on whether it's a developing country or not. Both of them is associated with poor hygiene and once again, guess what? Poor sewage treatment. Uh, people ingest the bacteria from contaminated food. If, once again, you can get clean water supply, good sewage treatment up, then that's going to solve a lot of the problems. Shigellosis is very similar to salmonellosis in that the Shigella bacteria is going to attach to the epithelial cells in the intestines. Now, in this case, it's going to typically be in the large intestines, it's engulfed, it replicates, it then infects neighboring cells. It does not, it, well, it can penetrate into the blood, but then it's very quickly destroyed. How? Because it's phagocytose, so, so you don't end up with a bacteremia like you do for Shigella. Shigella dysentery secretes a toxin called the Shiga toxin. Uh, this causes a very severe, um, basically diarrhea. It stops protein synthesis in the host cell. Um, you need to replace fluid and electrolytes again, um, trying to keep the patient hydrated. Yersinia is a normal pathogen of animals. There's three different species. All of them contain different virulence plasmids that contain things such as adhesins that help them attach to your cells. Uh, they will also inject proteins that tend to cause cell death or macrophages, etc. Um, most of these species can be acquired because you consume contaminated food, consume contaminated water, and it's going to cause some type of um, gastrointestinal distress. There is one species, Yersenia pestis, that is very, very highly virulent. It is a non-enteric pathogen. It will cause uh, diseases other than those uh, associated with gastrointestinal tract. Yersenia pestis is the causative agent of bubonic plague and pneumonic plague. Pneumonic plague is when you uh, have airborne transmission and inhale into the lungs, the this bacteria, the causative agent. Bubonic plague is when uh, it is the same uh, causative agent, Yersinia pestis, but it is introduced either by direct contact, a bite, say, from a rodent or a flea that has been feeding on rodents. And then it will inflect, infect in the lymph nodes and cause a bubose, which is a swelling of the infected lymph node. For your Yersinia pestis, um, ideally, of course, diagnosis as fast as possible so you can start treatment as fast as possible. Usually those characteristic symptoms of the bubose will be enough to help with the diagnosis. And there are a lot of drugs that will be effective in treating it. So with the family of the Enterobacter AC, you can see it does affect several different uh, systems. Once again, put it in the wrong location and it becomes opportunistic. Pastoral AC is one of the other families that we had talked about. Uh, still gram negative. Most of these are small, non-modal, the facultative anaerobes. Uh, they have usually some additional requirements for growth, such as heme or cytochromes. The two main uh, genera of human pathogens would be the Pastorella and the Haemophilus. Pastorella is normally found in 
your oral cavity, the nasopharyngeal cavities. Um, humans are often infected by amoebites. You often get a localized inflammation. Um, for somebody who's immunosuppressed will be more susceptible to the infection becoming more widespread, and if it gets in the blood, having bacteremia. Diagnosis is going to be done by identification of the bacteria from the specimen from the patient, and usually start with antibacterial drugs, antibiotics, that's going to be effective. Haemophilus, um, a very small pleomorphic bacilli, meaning different shapes. They tend to colonize the mucous membranes of humans, and as I said, some of these are opportunistic. This is what it looks like if you see multi shape. Haemophilus influenzae um, have a capsule that, once again, if it has a capsule that is a virulence factor that tends to help to resist phagocytosis. Haemophilus influenza type B, also known as Hib, is the most significant strain of these. It can cause meningitis. Um, because of the vaccination program, the um, number of cases has greatly reduced. Bartonelli is an aerobic bacilli found in animals, um, but other animals it does not cause disease, but in humans it can. It can cause Bartonellosis, which is fever, headache, muscle pain, joint pain, sometimes causing chronic skin infections. Um, this is endemic in Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia, so hopefully you won't have to deal with it here, but I never know where you guys will end up working. Uh, another species, Bartonella quintana, is the causative agent of trench fever, which was very common in World War I. Um, it's transmitted by body lice, once again causes fever, headaches, pain. Uh, can cause additional uh, diseases in your immunocompromised patient. And then Bartonella helsinii causes cat scratch disease. This is, the name implies it's transmitted through a cat biting or scratching. It's more common in children here in the United States. Um, at the site of the scratch or the bite where the infection, where it was introduced into the body, oftentimes you get swelling, can cause uh, fever, tiredness, you can treat it with antibiotics. Um, like I say, it's, it's more common in children because they haven't learned yet that when the cat is hissing at you, it means leave it alone. So here's an example of where someone um, by the ear, they got scratched by the cat and you have the swelling at that site. Brucella is a non-mobile, small aerobic cocci bacilli. It's still gram-negative. It can infect animals or humans. Um, it can cause what's known as brucellos brucellosis. <coughs> Excuse me. A lot of times, um, you may not even realize you have it and be asymptomatic. If you do uh, show symptoms, usually it's with a fever that's fluctuating. You have a fever, and then you're like, okay, now I'm fine. Oh, now I have a fever again. That it's up and down. How do you get it? Oftentimes by handling contaminated animal or contaminated consuming contaminated dairy products. So this shows um, how the number of cases of that has also been decreasing, which is a good sign. Bordetella is a non-modal coccybacillus, gram negative, aerobic. The most important one in this group, the most important species, is Bordetella pertussis, which is the causative agent of whooping cough. Typically, this is seen more in children than in adults. Um, things that help make this more virulent is that it does produce adhesins to help it attach uh, to your cells, the host cells, and it also does produce, as you can see, several different types of toxins. Oftentimes what happens is by coughing, uh, it is spread by inhalation. So you breathe in the bacteria. This shows a number of cases of pertussis or whooping cough. Since the vaccine has greatly, greatly decreased. You can see where the vaccine was introduced in the late, in the early 60s and then 
certainly by the late 60s, early 70s, the number of cases had tremendously been reduced. Now this is showing for the United States. Now one of the problems here, we're starting to see increases again. Part of this has to do with individuals who do not vaccinate their children. There was a report that came out about the time we start seeing an increase here of uh, cases saying that um, vaccinations did contain preservatives and other materials that could cause adverse side effects. Number one, there's always a chance of some adverse side effects, but what the paper was saying is that it also put children who receive vaccinations at a higher risk of developing autism. And a lot of people got hold of this paper and really held it up and then refused to have their children vaccinated, not only with pertussis, but any of our known uh, vaccines right now. So they, they refused to follow the immunization records meaning their children are not protected. And they always use this one paper that had been published as for the reasoning as to why to not but to vaccinate their children. What happened a few years ago is that the scientist who wrote that paper, because in the meantime, let me back up a second. The paper came out. Several other scientists tried to repeat the study, and no one has been able to repeat the work and come out with the data. Everyone else that's tried to do studies have shown that, no, there are, there's not an increased risk by taking the vaccinations of having other things such as autism develop. The scientists that wrote the paper a few years ago finally came out and admitted that it was all fraud. He just made up the data. That's why no one could repeat it. Unfortunately, that information has not been widely distributed in the media, and some people have chosen to ignore that. And so there is a, a population of people who have refused to follow the immunization recommendations and do not have their children vaccinated. Thereby, their children now are susceptible to catching pertussis or measles or whichever uh, causative agent of the disease you're talking about. This is why we're seeing, as seen on this graph now, an increase in the number of cases of pertussis. We have seen more recent outbreaks of measles, which is caused by a different agent, but same type idea. With You've already covered the section on immunology, where the idea with vaccines is if you can get a high percentage of the population protected, that allows you then to have what we call herd immunity. And that protects the people who are not able to be vaccinated. It helps to protect the immunocompromised. Is that if you can get a larger majority of your population with protection, it protects then the entire community as well. Unfortunately, as I said, as from these graphs, we have seen some very significant peaks in cases of pertussis here in the United States. Hopefully this will go down. This shows the, the bacteria is the pinkish color uh, rod, as you can see, in amongst the epithelial cilia. This is a long illness when you get whooping cough or pertussis. Incubation period, typically for so many things you have no symptoms. Then you enter a period where the, um, the number of bacteria are increasing. You get sneezing, uh, runny nose, fever. Then you're going to progress to the cough, which has kind of a whooping sound at the end of it where it gets the name from. Vomiting, you've been sick for several weeks, you're exhausted at this point. And then finally you enter into the convalescent stage where you're finally starting uh, to feel a little better. You think you're on the road to recovery. You need to be careful in this uh, time period, the convalescent period, of not picking up a secondary infection. Your body is worn out from fighting this first infection. How do you diagnose 
pertussis. Usually it's by symptoms. It has a classic cough to it. How do you treat it? It's usually supportive prevention. Like I said, there is the vaccination. Usually um, you have diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Um, Burkholdia. Uh, this is an interesting bacteria in that it is used oftentimes at, for bioremediation. That's using the bacteria to clean up contaminated environmental sites. Um, so it's very good at breaking down very complex molecules. The problem is it can be an opportunistic pathogen, especially for cystic fibrosis uh, patients. Cinnamonads. These um, are very commonly found in the soil along decaying matter, moist environments. They are becoming, or have been for a while, a problem in hospitals because they're becoming more resistant to antibiotics. They are opportunistic pathogens. Cinnamonus aeruginosa normally is not part of your microbiota. Uh, it usually will not cause a disease. However, it will be opportunistic, once again, in your immunocompromised patients. It can produce adhesins to help it stick to your cells, the host cells. It can produce capsule, it can produce toxins and enzymes. So if allowed, it can colonize almost any organ in any system. Um, it can be difficult to treat because we are seeing more drug resistance with it. This is an example of a patient with skin infection from the Pseudomonas. Within the Pseudomonas family, you also have Moraxia and the Cinebacter. Um, Usually you're not going to see these causing diseases, but they can be opportunistic, uh, can be found in water, soil, sewage. So once again, keep that water supply clean. Franciella tularensis uh, is an intracellular parasite of animals, has a huge range of hosts. It can be found in reservoirs in the United States in rabbits, ticks, muskrats. It can cause tularemia. It can be spread by a, a bite from an infected tick or if you have contact with the infected animal. Uh, so if, say it's in rabbits, if you choose to eat rabbits or if you work with raising rabbits, it can um, be infecting the rabbit and from there infect you. It is highly infectious. Um, the symptoms for tularemia it's very similar to other diseases, so it's often misdiagnosed. Once it is properly diagnosed, it can be treated with antibiotics. Just be careful uh, if you are dealing with some of these animals. Like I say, rabbits are a big one. Uh, so just be careful if you deal with them on a regular basis. Legionella, this pleomorphic bacteria, once again, meaning it has multiple shapes, is commonly found in water. Humans become... Uh, Infected with it when they inhale from uh, the water source is creating an aerosol and it gets in the air and you inhale it. Legionella pneumophilia is the most common one. This is what it looks like growing on specialized charcoal yeast extract auger. It will result in pneumonia. It can be fatal, especially if someone already has a compromised immune system. Uh, Pontiac fever is very similar to it, but you don't develop the pneumonia and it's not fatal. For the diagnosis of Legionella's by antibody staining and serological testing, um, there are some medicines used to treat Legionnaire's disease. Prevention, um, you could say, yeah, it'd be nice to eliminate bacteria, but that's just not possible. Uh, this particular bacteria was discovered when the American Legion was having a convention, one of their annual conventions, and several members of who were attending the convention became sick and developed pneumonia, and several ended up in the hospital. There were, unfortunately, some fatalities as well, and they were trying to figure out what was going on 
the common thread was that the convention, and this is how it got its name because it was an American Legion convention, um, what they found out was that at the convention site, and several of the people were staying at the motel at the convention site, but they finally tested the air conditioning. It was held in the summertime, and the water supply for the air conditioning unit was contaminated with the bacteria. And this was when they finally put two and two together and realized what was happening. is that the air conditioning was basically making aerosol, this contaminated water, going through the air ducts, spreading it everywhere, and so people were inhaling it. Because of this outbreak and discovering this, this is now why there are regulations with air conditioning units, especially those in commercial places, that if water is circulating, how often that water has to be totally replaced. It cannot be sitting there for days on end. There is a time limit. It must be replaced. And that all goes to some of these changes because of... Uh, Okay, we found that there was a problem we didn't realize before. We had this outbreak. How can we prevent it from ever happening again? Coxella is a very small aerobic bacteria. It's an obligate intracellular parasite. Um, it's often transmitted by inhalation when you are associated with infected animals or pets. And this shows the infected body that the coxiella makes. Q fever is one of the diseases caused by it. Um, usually you're treated with antibiotics for long term. So your pathogenic gram-negative anaerobic bacilli are the predominant microorganisms that are found in your GI tract in the problem is when it goes to other parts of the body, uh, such as the upper respiratory, then you start having issues. If it gets to the meninges, you can have issues. Um, now, they're important. They're not all bad. You don't want to get rid of them because you need them. They are inhibiting the growth of other pathogens as they're passing through your GI tract. They often are inhibiting in the reproductive tract, etc. They, in the intestines, they produce vitamins like vitamin K. They produce some of your vitamin precursors. They aid in digestion of the food. So you have to have them. It's just one of those things. They do a good job when they're in the location they're supposed to be, but you put them in the wrong location and then they can cause disease. Bacteriorities are normally in the intestines and upper respiratory, um, but once again, you put them in the wrong place. In the reproductive system, they can cause genital infections in women. If they get on the skin, you have a wound, they can cause wound infections. They can cause abdominal inf infections. This is a sample of what it looks like when grown on auger. Prevotella, once again, normal in some areas, put them in the wrong place and you're going to start having an infection. How would you treat it? Remove the infected tissue.